Father, we honor you. We give you the highest reverence there is. Jesus, we exalt you above the worship of the people of the earth. We magnify your name. Let us reverence God. Timothy called him the invisible, the immortal, the only wise God. Jeremiah called him the fountain of living water. Job called him the breath of every living creature. The psalmist called him the lifter of my head, the shield around me. We bless you, O oh God. We can go from Genesis to Revelation. Thousands of people have given you thousands of names and that is because you are worthy. You deserve it all. You deserve it all, my Father. We honor you this morning. We ask that our worship rise up to you as incense in the name of Jesus. Thank you, wonderful Father. Do you know that song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name? Can we sing that song in reverence to the Lord? When we stand before God in heaven, is one of the things that we're going to sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. I want you to see us standing before Jesus. Oh, Jesus' name, angels prostrate. Lord over the earth, oh God, your commandments are Lord to us, oh God. We glorify your holy name as we've come this morning to listen to your word. I ask that your word will bring direction, it will bring illumination, it will bring wisdom, Lord. It will bring guidance, Lord. In the name of Jesus, give us that bread that will satisfy our soul. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit, for being in us and for being with us. We glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at something very important. You can take your seat if you're here. We welcome our online participants that are logged in from everywhere. If you're listening by radio or you're watching us online, you're welcome to church this morning. This is the Oak House Church where we raise men that look exactly like Christ. Our vision is to model the message, to produce men and women that look exactly like Christ, to be conformed to the image of Christ in such a way that when you see anyone who has been produced by what God is doing in this ministry, that person talks like Christ, that person thinks like Christ, he acts like Christ, every single thing is exactly like Christ and that is the focus and the direction of every single thing that we do here and because of that vision, it controls the sort of messages that we bring from the pulpit. So today we're going to be looking at something very essential and I will encourage you to concentrate and pay critical attention because what we're going to be sharing today is very vital for your spiritual well-being so today we're going to be looking at spiritual fitness how to be spiritually fit now we're looking at how to be spiritually fit because in the book of matthew chapter 22 jesus painted an alarming scenario if you read matthew 25 jesus painted three alarming scenarios not one three alarming scenarios and throughout his ministry if you observe the ministry of Jesus, he kept on painting that scenario as a warning to us who call him Lord, who follow him, to who serve him. Now in response, Matthew chapter 25 is a response to three questions that the disciples had asked him. They had asked him, 
The Bible tells us in uh, Matthew 24, really, where the discourse started from. They, uh, they were on the Mount of Olives, and disciples asked him three questions. Number one, they said, what shall this, when shall these things happen? You know, talking about the end of the world. Number two, they asked him another question. What shall be the sign of your coming? Number three, they said, what shall be the end of the world? So they asked him three, three questions as you begin Matthew chapter 24. And then in the whole of Matthew 24, Jesus was talking to them about the signs of the end time, how to know when Jesus is coming and all of that because he did not want us to be caught on our ways. That is what happened in 24. Now he continued the discussion in 25. And what he did was in Matthew 24, he painted a picture of what will happen during the last days. In Matthew 25, in still continuing that discussion, he now began to bring solution. He began to tell you the type of people or the quality of people that will live at that time. And then he painted three very alarming scenarios. The first scenario he painted was about 10 virgins. 10 virgins meaning that they were all Christians, they were all believers. But the Bible put a mark in between them. He said, that five of them were foolish, another five were wise. But the important thing to know that they were all Christians, they were all believers, they called him master, they called him Lord, they were all in church. The Bible said they were all virgins, meaning what? They had not been defiled by the world system. But if you notice at the end of that verse, the Bible says that when Jesus came, when the bridegroom came, they were shocked out and he made a statement to them. He said, I don't know you. And the second scenario he painted was about somebody who gave talents to his seven. He gave five, he gave two, he gave one. The Bible tells us that when that master came back, he began to ask reports from the people that he had given this talent. And, you know, he congratulated or um, what do you call it? Uh, praised the people who did well. And the one that did not do well, the Bible said that that one was cast into the lake of fire. He painted the third alarming scenario. And that is about somebody who... Um, those people who ignore the less privileged and all of that, there are five of them, the gatekeepers, he said, the poor, the naked, the hungry, the prisoner, and all of that. And why I call it alarming scenarios, that if you read the whole of Matthew 25, those people that did not make it at the end of the day were not unbelievers. So in Matthew 25, he was not addressing people who do not go to church. He was not addressing people who do not read their Bible. He was addressing people who called him Lord. In all these three scenarios, the people called him Lord. The people called him master. The people came to church. The people believed. The people did all those things that we would typically all do. But why did I say it's alarming? They did not make it. So that's why the matter of being spiritually fit is something that you must know. You can't guess because eternity is too long to be wrong. You can't, when you cross over to eternity, that's when you now realize wait a minute, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. When the door is shut, Jesus said that when the master shuts that door, that is end. The door has been shut. You are disconnected permanently from this side of life and you now face an eternity. So that's why you need to understand how to be spiritually fit. In the backdrop of that, if you read what um, Jesus said, maybe we should do a little bit of reading. Let's look at Luke chapter, okay, let's read Luke chapter 13. If want to dovetail from where we read in Matthew 25, Jesus was repeatedly making this warning. If read from verse 23 of Luke chapter 13, the Bible says to us, Then one said to him, because we read the previous verse, he had been going from city to city preaching. Then the Bible says in verse 23, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive. If you read NLT, it says struggle or work hard. If we have the NLT version, uh, I will read it from that particular scripture. It says work hard. In other words, in response to your question, he was asking, are there few people that are going to be saved? Why did a man ask that question? If you read 21, the Bible tells us that Jesus had been going from city to city preaching. And so one man who had been following him all, by the time he finished listening to the message of Jesus, he had only one question to ask him. He said, would there be few that will be saved? And then Jesus' response was, work hard. In other words, some translations say, make every effort. Put in the energy, put in the work that is required. This is coming from Jesus. He said, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. So Jesus was telling him that this door into God's kingdom is narrow. He said, many will try to enter, but they will fail. Let's look at verse 25. We're going to read to 27. He says, when the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. Just like I told you earlier, once that door is locked, and that door is locked either in death or in rapture, so that means whatever correction, whatever thing you're doing is before the door is locked. He said, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. Notice again, these people were calling him Lord. 
But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Now, see their response in 26 and 27. He said, then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. If you read it from King James, though you don't have to switch, if you read it from King James, he said, but we ate and drank in your presence. We ate, we drank in your presence. We enjoyed the presence of the Lord. And you taught in our streets. You, Jesus, you were the one teaching us. Let's see 27. And he will reply, I tell you, that's I'm repeating to you, I don't know you or where you are from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. How does a man spend his life in the presence of the Lord, listening to the teaching of Jesus, and at the end of the day, be qualified to be told, get away from me, all you who do evil. And the person was calling him Lord. Now, I start to emphasize this particular statement because if you read this, is the, the, the Bible in this Luke 13 was addressing regular people who come to church who are born again. They were not pastors or ministers or anything. Now, as though to emphasize this particular scripture, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus was still repeating the same thing. But this time, he was saying, just in case you think that being a pastor or being a minister will save you, he now told us another thing in Matthew 7, 21. He said, this, the, the problem with these guys, they healed the sick, they cast out devils, they did all these great and mighty things. And Jesus repeated the same thing he told the people who come to church and enjoy the presence of the Lord. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, is twice for emphasis, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. Now, reading all of this, it will be very clear to you that we have to know how to be spiritually fit. How do I know? How can I be sure that when I get to this point, this is not the response I'm going to get? Let's read one more scripture. Luke chapter 9, verse 20, 62. we we'll look at what Jesus said there concerning spiritual fitness. He said, but Jesus told him, Anyone who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not what? It's not what? Fit for the kingdom of God. That immediately tells me that not everyone is fit for the kingdom. Not even those who have been in active service, they are not all fit for the kingdom. Because the Bible said they already put their hand on the plow, so they're already walking. They're obviously saved. They're obviously born again. They're obviously working for God. But he says, not everyone that plows, that labors in the kingdom is fit for the kingdom of God. That means some people are fit for the kingdom, some people are not fit for the kingdom. Now, if you are not fit for the kingdom of God, is it fit for heaven that you will be? The obvious answer is no. You first of all have to be fit for the kingdom before you are fit for the kingdom of heaven or being with God. So I'm going to tell you there are five ways to check yourself if you are spiritually fit. Because in physical fitness, I'll immediately tell you the first time. If I tell you to run from here for like a mile, by the time you do one kilometer, you're already out of breath, you're already panting, you're already gasping, you're already dying. That already immediately tells me that you're what? You are not spiritually fit. That means you cannot make the journey of one mile. Man, now the same thing applies in spiritual fitness like Jesus was saying not everyone is fit for the kingdom what is that thing that will make me fit for the kingdom so I think the best way to approach this is to tell you what will not make you fit for the kingdom and those are the things that people assume will make them fit for the kingdom and quickly run through them that you answered an altar call will not make you fit for the kingdom that you are an active service will not make you fit for the kingdom that you do a lot of giving, you pay your tithes, you do your offering, do all of those things, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, if you, if you pay your tithes or whatever, you will go to heaven and all of that, which we all know those things cannot be collaborated from scripture, yeah? So giving will not make you fit for the kingdom. Service in the house of God will not make you fit for the kingdom. All those activities that you do, that you pray a lot, you do a lot of prayer, you see some people, seven hours prayer, three hours prayer, they will fast, they will pray, they will give, they, all those things are not guarantees that you are fit for the kingdom. So what are those things then that make you spiritually fit? You want to check your spiritual fitness, you want to be sure you can carry the spiritual muscles. Remember Jesus told that man, he said work hard, which means there's energy, there's effort. So if you're not spiritually fit, you can't work hard. Nobody can work hard if he's not fit. If you're extremely hungry, and I tell you to lift a 50 pound weight, you can't for the simple reason that you are not fit. So let's do some analysis. 
if I had a pen or whatever, I'd have shown you how to check your spiritual thermometer. But that's fine. I'll just work without it. How to check your spiritual thermometer is another way of saying how to check your spiritual fitness. Now, number one sign of spiritual fitness is the same thing with our body. The first sign that you are having problems spiritually is your conscience. That's the first sign. Let's maybe we should do it, some work in uh, Hebrews chapter nine. Let's do some work in Hebrews chapter nine. Verse 14. Let's see what the blood of Jesus comes to do. Okay. He said, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify what? Your consciences from sinful deeds. So you see, the first thing the blood of Jesus comes to do, because many times we don't realize what the blood of Jesus comes to do. He says he's coming to do what? Purify your conscience from sinful deeds. It is not just about the blood of Jesus purging your sins. What the blood, first of all, comes to do is to purge your conscience. Let me explain what it is. If you have a conscience that has not been touched by God, what that means is that when you do things, how you know is you do things that are wrong and you are normal. You lie, you don't feel the prick. You, you, you gossip about somebody, you don't feel the prick. It amazes me how somebody will be a Christian, keep malice and be praying and to him, that person is able to pray. There's a problem. You have a problem with your conscience and that is the first sign that there's something wrong. You know, the um, biggest reward or the biggest benefit of our body is something that we don't like and that thing is called pain. Pain is your friend. Do you know why pain is your friend? If there was no pain, you would have died by now. Pain is a signal to your body that something is wrong. Imagine if you fall down from a 20-story building and you land on the floor and you don't feel any pain. You will know that your entire, all your bones are broken. You will get up from that place, you're bleeding, you get up from that place and think that all is well. You take two steps and you just drop dead. That's why people die from what is called internal bleeding. They are bleeding on the inside, so to them they think they are okay. When they are involved in an accident, they look outside, there is no scratch. So they say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm, I'm fine. What do they do? Nobody believes them. They take them to the hospital to test them. Do you know why you can be bleeding internally and you will not know? So pain is a sign that something is wrong. There is really no sickness called fever. Fever is just a sign that something is wrong in your body. Headache is a sign that something is wrong in your body. It is time to turn down and check and see what it is that is out of place. That is what your conscience does for you. Every time you start sinning and you don't feel any how, you have a problem. You are not spiritually fit. If you can keep malice, you can lie, and you don't feel that prick, that conscience that, ah, this thing I've done is bad. And you can boldly come to God and be praying and be doing all sorts of things, and you are not bothered. Number one sign that there is a problem. Let's do some work. Let's look at the scripture. Let's look at the book of uh, Timothy. Let's see what the Bible has to say there. Uh, let's look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. See what a dead a conscience does. Okay, so he says, having faith and what? A good conscience. He's talking about some people. He said, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Let's look at it from New Living Translation. It throws better light if you read it from there. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Yeah. He says, cling to your faith in Christ. As you're clinging to your faith in Christ, he's telling you don't ignore something. Because what we do is we cling to our faith in Christ. We've come to the altar, given our lives to Christ. But the Bible says we leave something behind. He said cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. I'll tell you how to load your conscience with all sorts of things. He said for some people have deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Perhaps you're in church. You are clinging to your faith in Christ, but your faith has been shipwrecked because issues of the conscience. When a man has a lively conscience, the slightest thing disturbs him. If you genuinely gave your life to Christ, do you know that when you break state laws, it disturbs you? I'll give you an example. If you're driving and you throw paper out of the window, how do you feel? You feel bad as though you had killed somebody. What's his name? Paul Washer was telling, was, you know, was preaching. And he said, 
he, him and his friend, his, him and his friend, they went to um, a bookshop. They were looking for this particular book, you know, for a long time. Then somebody told them that it is in a particular bookshop. So him and his friend, they ran inside the bookshop and they saw that there were only two copies left. So he was in front, the friend was at the back. They are, they are pastors, the friend was at the back. So he put his hand and took the first copy, opened it and saw that a page was torn. So he gave it to his friend. And took the second copy. Now, when he gave it to his friend, the friend was like, Oh, this is such a good person. He took and gave me. But Paul Washer knew that the reason he gave him is because that page was torn and the book was very important. He wanted to read the entire book and all of that. Paul Washer said that when he got home, he was repenting, he was rolling on the ground, he was crying as though he had killed a man. That his conscience was so heavy as though he had committed murder. He cried and cried and repented and repented. The thing couldn't lift. He had to call his friend and say, please, I need to see you. By then, this was 2 a.m. in the morning. He said, I need to see you. The friend said, can't it wait till morning? He said, no, I'm dying. He's too heavy on my conscience. And then he drove all the way to his friend's house, knelt down, began to beg the friend. The friend said, what happened? He said, you know why I gave you the book? It's because it was taught. That's why. He said, is that why you are crying? He said, yes, it's heavy on my conscience. Please forgive me. You know that thing he did? The man has a lively conscience. He said he was crying as though he had killed a man. But there are people that lie and they are normal. There are people that are still and they are normal. There are people that are proud and they are normal. There's a problem. Your faith has been shipwrecked. He said, listen, cling to your faith in Christ. So, But you see that your conscience, you're going to keep it clean. Some people have seared their conscience to a hot iron. How do you do that? The Bible tells us about it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. Some people have seared, how do you sear your conscience with a hot iron? When you constantly sin and sin and sin deliberately. You know, let me explain. When you take a sheet of paper and you take a pencil and you write on the pencil, so the sheet of paper is your conscience is white the pencil is sin the eraser is the blood of jesus so let's do some exercise so you sin you write with the pencil the, the eraser comes and cleans would the eraser clean it if you write on that person 10 billion times a day would the eraser still clean it yes of these three elements which one will be getting damaged is it the paper the pencil or the eraser which one the paper has a problem because the more you clean you keep cleaning, 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 cleaning. After some time, the paper starts shredding. So the more you sin, you know how people are, let me sin, I'll repent later. As you keep doing it, there are people that say, well, God will forgive me tomorrow. As you keep doing it, when you repent, God will forgive you. But something, you are weakening your conscience. When you allow sin to stay, that's why Jesus said, don't allow your anger wait till the next day. When you allow those things, when you allow unrepented sin to stay, you are weakening your conscience. It's no more lively. It's no more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So when you are going wrong, the Holy Spirit can no more point to you and say, look, there's a problem. If when you gave your life to Christ, you know, can he say that when he tells somebody, you are foolish. He, one day his friend made a comment and said, oh, you are foolish. Just go away. Just a casual statement. He said he couldn't sleep. He felt so bad. He went to go and repent. But today we insult people. We abuse people. We curse people. And we are normal. And we can actually go on our knees and see pray. The Bible says, you have made a shipwreck of your faith. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, watch, he says some will turn away from the true faith. What does that mean? They were in the true faith before, but they turned away. They will follow after deceptive spirits. King James called it seducing spirits and teachings that come from demons. King James calls it doctrines of devils he said in the last days you're going to see a lot of that see what he says in verse 2 of that same scripture he said these people are hypocrites liars and their consciences are dead they were they turned away from true faith because you know what seducing spirits came and seduced their heart what do these seducing spirits do they begin to gradually seduce your heart away from god and then you shift away from having faith towards god next thing you know that you're now pursuing the things of life the seducing spirit have seduced your heart away from the lord you come to church no more because of jesus because of what you can get your heart has been seduced and when that happens the bible says your conscience has a problem your conscience is no more a safe guide you lied yesterday and you are normal you can you know i watch um what do you call that a lot of crime movies because i like the way the detectives reason so sometimes they'll say look into my eyes and tell me 
that you didn't kill this person. In my mind, I'm like, you got to be kidding me right now. Of course, you look into your eye and tell you I didn't kill the person. Why? He has a dead conscience. I don't believe I can look into your eye and lie to you. He doesn't care. He's only a Christian that will avert his eyes when he has done something wrong. Remember the story that Jesus was telling about that? Two people. He said one was a proud man. He had paid his tithe, done all that. He said the other one came. He said he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He said, oh, have mercy on me. You know, I am a humble person. I am this, this, have me. The Bible said one thing. He couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. Because when that one sins, he has a conscience that pricks and disturbs him. Does your conscience still disturb you when you do things wrong? When you do the simplest things, does your conscience still disturb you? If it doesn't disturb you, if you can lie, you can cheat. You are not spiritually fit. Let's take a look at the second thing. I'm trying to be fast. Let's take a look at the second. I'll lump the second and the third one together. How do you know that you are spiritually fit? The reason for the first spiritual fitness is so that when you do something wrong, the Holy Spirit can immediately correct you. If not, you'll be a liar and you have developed the habit of lying. And when you get on that day, you say, I am a Christian liar. The door will open for you. They are Christian liars. They are lying pastors. The Bible, in fact, Jeremiah called them lying prophets. How do you put lying and prophet in the same sentence? They are lying prophets. Jesus said, these prophets have deceived my people. They have given heed to doctrines of devils. They are fornicating pastors. They are hypocritical pastors. There are so many things. Pastors, normal people, everybody. But what will save you is if you go back to God and say, Lord, punch my conscience. Give me a soft, tender, lively conscience that cannot tolerate sin. That cannot tolerate anything that is wrong. The reason when you get it, the slightest thing you're able to pick it. When you go on your knees and something is wrong, the Holy Spirit can quickly correct you and you can quickly repent. That's how you know. So, number two and number three, I'm going to pull them together because every time one is mentioned, the other one is mentioned together. So, it's called righteous. Okay, let's read 1 John 3.10. So, when I'm, I'm done with these five, I want you to mark yourself and know whether you're spiritually fit or not. So, John was teaching us two other symptoms of you know spiritual fitness say so now we can tell who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil don't you want to know who are god's children who are satan's children i want to know so he said anyone who does not live righteously the reason he used the word anyone is because whether you go to church or not whether you're a pastor or not whether you're a believer or not he's saying anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. That's intense. That means you can be in church, you don't belong to God. You can be an usher, you don't belong to God. You can be a pastor, but you don't belong to God. The sign that you belong to God, two things. One, that you live righteously. The second is like the first, that you walk in love among believers. Let's take a look at another scripture. Let's look at... Um, First Thessalonians chapter 4, we read verse 7 to 9. I noticed I was doing a study on this and I observed every time righteousness is mentioned, love comes somewhere around there. Meaning you can't do one without the other. We're going to read uh, verse 7, 8 and 9. If you want to pull the three of them, this is a good time to do that. So we'll just read all at the same time. Great, thank you. He said, God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. This is our calling. This is what he has called us to do. This is why you are saved. He said, therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God. So can you imagine when, what the Bible is saying? That when you live an impure life, you are rejecting God. It's not just that you disobey the law. You are rejecting God. You are signing yourself out of the kingdom register. It means that you are signing yourself out of the book of life. Jesus will not remove your name out of the book of life. You do it by yourself, by living an impure life. The Bible says, you are not disobeying, refuses to live by this rule, is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God. Who gives his Holy Spirit to you? Let's look at verse 9 then. He said, but we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. Did you see? Immediately after teaching about holiness, the next thing he talked about love. You see it again in 1 John chapter 3 verse 10. The two of them go hand in hand. You can't pursue righteousness with God and not pursue love for the brethren. Let's pull out another scripture that will help us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Walk at living in peace with everyone. And walk at living a holy life. Do you see again 
love, righteousness, peace with men, holy living. You can't separate them. A truly holy man will walk in love. A truly righteous man will walk in love. A sign that you are not walking in holiness is the fact that you don't love brethren. I'm going to show you the three dimensions of love very quickly. He said, walk at living in peace with everyone. And walk at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. King James puts it this way. He said, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no eye will see the Lord. Let no one deceive you. Holiness is a prerequisite for your spiritual fitness. Remember all the scriptures we read. Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. He said, if you live an impure life, you are writing yourself away from the kingdom of of God. So I'm going to answer a question maybe some of you have in your heart. Must I be perfect? What if I make a mistake now? A rapture occurs now. Where will I go? Will Jesus say, hey, you, you are a worker of iniquity now. Depart from me. The answer Jesus taught us is in Revelations. So it will help you understand something. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. He was teaching a particular church this we read it from this King James. I would like us to read it from King James 18 and 19. Then I like the way New Living Translation puts it. But let's read New uh, King James Version first or New King James, whichever one. Revelation chapter 18, verse 19. We'll read that one, then we'll come to NLT version. Okay, so I'll read it from here. He says, Christ letter is writing to the church in Titeria. Let's read from King James first or New Living Translation, and then we'll come back to NLT. I want us to look at how we put it there, then we can now come back to this. But I'll read it from my from here he says write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Titaria for these are the words of the son of God whose eyes are blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished brass now Peter to verse 19 he says I know all that you have done for me your love and faith your ministry and steadfast perseverance in fact you now excel in all these virtues even more than you did at first what is Jesus talking about here? He said, you are doing all those good things. But he now made a comment. He said, you are doing better now than when you first started. This is what Jesus is looking for. He said, I see constant improvement. I see constant improvement. I see that you are better now than you were before. If you read King James, he said, I see that the last is better than the later. If we have King James, yes. He says, I know your works. In other words, everything you are doing for me, I know it. I'm seeing it. I mean, this is very comforting. He said, I know your charity. That's your love. He said, I know your service. This is great. That means as we serve God, he's taking notes. He says, I see your patience, your works, and that the, and the last to be more than the first. What's he saying? How you were last year is not how you were this year. You're getting better. How you were in 2019 is not how you were in 2020. How you were in January is not how you were in March. Jesus wants every day purity. You're increasing in purity. So that's what he's looking for. Constant growth. Where Jesus has a problem is when you're not making any plans to change. That's where the problem is. So when he came to this church, he now come after this verse, he now complained and said, there are some of you who are following the teachings of Jezebel. And then he made a statement to them. Uh, verse 24. Verse 24. Let's see what he said to them. His admonition to this church. He said, but unto you I say, unto the rest of Titaria, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put on you no other burden. What is he saying? I'm not going to demand anything extra from you. Why is he not demanding anything extra? Because there's constant improvement. That means on a daily basis, my quality of purity is increasing. Every day, my quality of service is increasing. My quality of love is increasing. I'm not getting worse. I'm getting better. Can Jesus see this in you? Can he look at you and say, in January, you used to lie 20 times a day. But I see the effort you are making in improving. The only thing he told them was in verse 25. He said, but hold fast to what you have till I come. This is the only button I'm going to put on you. I'm not asking you to change. What I'm, that improvement I'm seeing, keep doing it. This is what he's looking for. So let's quickly jump to, uh, we've looked at how many now. Can you go with me? Number one is what? Conscience. Number two is what? Say again. Number two is righteousness. Number three is love. And I ask the question, must you be perfect on the day of rapture? The answer is what? What do you think the answer is? 
must you be perfect as in what is Jesus targeting? Constant. He's seen you that you come to God and you say, Lord, I notice I'm proud. Father, take away from me this pride, oh God. Take it away. He's seen the effort. He's seen that time when pride wants to rise up and you say, no, 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 I will not yield to pride. No, no, no. He said, I'm taking notes. He said that time when you want to lie, the pressure is, and you say, no, I am not going to lie. And you suppress it and all of that. And then every day, that lying spirit is dropping gradually until you get to the point, lies have gone. Then you say, what else, Lord? But he notices when you go to him, you're asking, Lord, search me. What are the things in my life that displease you? The Bible said there's a prayer that Solomon prayed. The Bible said, this prayer pleased the Lord. So you could say, what are those things that displease me? God will say, aha, you are quarrelsome. You say, okay, I'm going to take what I've dealt with pride. Now it's quarreling. And you begin to pray begin to cry out to God and you're walking on that journey on quarrelness oh, what's the word quarrelsome hey. then if that one goes you now go back and say Lord what else that's the attitude that makes heaven that's the attitude that means you are spiritually fit and it is so comforting for those of you that have been on this journey and you're walking on a daily basis every day you're taking one step closer to being like Christ God takes notes hallelujah let's look at the fourth one that many people don't realize that this is very important to God. Oh, I did say I was going to tell you the three dimensions of love. Because we've done righteousness, we haven't dealt with love. Now, if you read um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, let's do a quick walk on love and then uh, 1 John 3, 14. We know we have passed from death to life. How do we know? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother does what abides in death. So I may come to church 365 days a year. If I don't have love, the Bible says I still abide in death. Three dimensions of love. There's love what you do. There's a love in the heart. There are people that love you with their mouth, but their hearts are very far. They are angry with you. They abuse you in their heart. They do all of those things in their heart. So you love with your words. You love with your heart. You love with your action. The Bible says that if you see your brother, First John three seventeen says, if you have this world's goods and you see your brother that he has need, he said, don't turn away. Always have something to give. And when the Bible says you have something to give, it doesn't necessarily mean money. Give smile. Give an encouragement. Give so Don't let people come to you and go empty-handed. Give counsel. Give a kind word. Even when you want to give money to beggars and you don't have, tell them, oh, with a smile, treat them as human beings that Jesus died for. The Bible says, if you don't love your brother, remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible says, if you if you're, you can let your body be burnt and do all of those things and do all of those things. He said, if you don't have love, you are nothing before God. So God is a vital prerequisite for your spiritual fitness. Check your love temperature. And love is not, oh, I feel good about you. No. Look at what is listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at all those things. If you can have it in New Living Translation, love is patient, love is kind. For you to love people, you have to be patient with them. You have to understand that Chica is going to fail, but I'm going to help her. I'm not going to condemn her immediately just because she made a mistake. No, love suffers long. Love is kind. And while I am suffering long with you, I am kind in the process. The Bible says love does not envy. Okay, let's look at this. It says love is patient. So I am going to be patient. Come, so I'll be looking at you as I'm saying it. So Chica is a really horrible person, but not in real life. In real life, she's a good person. So you see, Chica has failed, but I'm going to be patient. I'm going to understand her frame that she's weak. So I'll be patient with her, helping her as much as I can. Then the Bible says, while I'm doing that, I'll be kind. I won't say, you need to speak, go away. No, I'm going to be patient and kind. I'm expressing love. The Bible says, love is not jealous or boastful. So when Chica now starts improving, and maybe God blesses her more, quote unquote, the way we say God bless him more, I'm not going to say, be jealous of her. When you act in jealousy, you're not walking in love. When you begin to boast and you are proud, you're not walking in love. So when I start to boast to Chica that, ah, you don't know, I'm richer than you, I'm finer than you, I'm more anointed than you, am I operating in love? No. They say, well, it does not demand its own way. You must not always win the argument. You must not always be right. It is not rude. It is not irritable. You know, easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. You know, there are some people, if you annoy them, after some time, and women like doing this, okay, men and women, they like doing this a lot. You do something, they'll say, that is how January 2015, you did it, I will never forget. During your father's burial, I will never forget what you did. Yes, I can forgive you, but I will never forget. Thank you. You are not walking in love. So let's run quickly. Let's look at the fourth one. 
Do you know that spiritual unproductivity makes you unfit for the kingdom? The Bible tells us that in Matthew 25, verse 14. Spiritual unproductivity. You're not producing anything for the kingdom. That means people who just come to church and sit down, they're not doing anything, no productivity. You're not spiritually fit. Look at what the Bible says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered them and all of that. You know the story. He gave them talents. He gave five, he gave ten, he gave one and all of that. So let's look at verse 30. This is the end of the story of those who he gave talents. Look at verse 30. Oh, Matthew chapter 25. He says, and cast what? The unprofitable servant into where? Outer darkness. That guy went to hell. He said, where there'll be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. For those who argue that it is heaven. Okay, no problem. Do you want to be in heaven where you be gnashing your teeth and weeping? Let's even assume it's heaven. Is this the kind of heaven you want to go to? Spiritual and productivity. There is nothing you are doing to advance the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, you are not fit for the kingdom. It's part of your spiritual fitness. What am I doing? Some people, all they do is come to God and collect and collect. Even their prayer is all about God, give me this, God, give me that, God, give me this, God, give me that. You're not spiritually fit. Have you ever asked yourself, what am I doing for the advancement of the kingdom of God? How am I contributing to what God is doing? You wake up in the morning, you have your bath, you come to church, you see that, you say, they didn't put the chair well. This church is scattered. Why did they put the blue light? Why didn't they put yellow light? The media people, they are very disorganized. The other day, network, what, what are you doing? What have you added to the advancement of the kingdom you call your own? You are unfit for the kingdom. It's there. Cast what? So ask yourself, number four, am I a profitable servant or am I an unprofitable servant? Let's quickly go to five as we begin to round up because I want us to do some check. When you ignore the gatekeepers of heaven, Matthew 25, let's go to verse 44. These are the things that Jesus taught us by himself. Then they also... Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Or take note of them. The first person is what? The hungry. The second is what? I'm calling them the gatekeepers. The first is the hungry. The second is the thirsty. The third is the stranger. The fourth is the naked. The fifth is the, um, the sick. And the sixth one is what? The prisoner. And did not minister to you. Then watch Jesus reply in verse 45. He said, then he will say to them, surely I say to you, in as much as you did this to the lead, to one of the, I say to you, in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. When you see people in the kingdom that fall into that category in verse 44, mention them again. Let's go back to verse 44. The hungry, somebody is hungry. The thirsty, that's they are basically poor. If you combine hungry and thirsty, that's why you can call it either five gatekeepers or six. If you break hungry and thirsty, there are two. So the hungry, thirsty, or the stranger, or the naked, or the sick, or the prison, and did not minister to you. Now, there are two dimensions of this. There are those who are hungry and thirsty spiritually. Because not just the physical. There are men who are hungry and thirsty spiritually. You didn't preach to them. You didn't feel them. You didn't reignite them with the word of God. There are people who are strangers. You did nothing to integrate them into the kingdom. They are born again. They are not established as believers. They are not being discipled. You did nothing. You know. They are those who are exposed. You did nothing about it. What did the Bible tell them in verse 45? He said, when you didn't do all of this, you did it to me. Now let's look at verse 46. And this, where would they go? Into everlasting punishment. What kind of punishment? Everlasting. Not because they lied or stole but because they ignored these gatekeepers. They ignored these gatekeepers. The Bible says, but the righteous into eternal life. Did you notice that the Bible calls people who, you know, they cared for the sick, the poor, blah, blah, blah. He called them the righteous. Those who did not. If you're not righteous, what are you? Unrighteous. The talent that God gave you, the money that God gave you, everything that God gave you is for the body of Christ. It is not for you to consume upon your own laws. With this five, if you stay on this five and mark yourself, you can tell whether or not you are spiritually fit. I want you to think through as we're going to pray now. I want you to ask yourself, am I spiritually fit? And if I'm not, where am I failing? Where is my issue? Have I sat down and I'm not involved in the, the, the last becoming better than the first? The way you are 
Is there any improvement? Can you really point to one improvement from January till now? Can you really point to one improvement from last week till now? Can somebody look at you now and say, ah, you have really changed. If you're a husband, ask your wife, have I changed? If you're a wife, ask your husband, have I changed? Are you still doing the same things you were doing when you were not saved? Are you still doing the same things you were doing when you were a young believer? You are not spiritually fit. You are not spiritually fit. We looked at the second, what is the quality of your righteousness? What is the quality of your love? What is the quality of your conscience? You see that your conscience, you lie. People even come to church and they steal church offering. They do all kinds of things. You are not spiritually fit. If you look at the churches, if you join us on Thursday by 4 p.m., we're doing a series on the churches. You see the kind of thing that Jesus commended. Studying that seven churches, we'll take a look at it. Pastor is taking us on that series on Thursday. If you log on by 4 Looking at those, I, I was studying what are the kind of things that Jesus commended. He never commended any of them for how they looked on the outward. He never commended them that their dressing was good or their dressing was not good. Those are not the kind of things that were the interest of Jesus. Look at the kind of things that were the interest of Jesus. Look at the kind of things that Jesus commends in a man and the things he complains in a man. If you are a foolish person, what you do is you will ignore the things that Jesus complained about. But if you're a wise person, you take those seven churches and look at yourself in the mirror of those churches. Am I the type that has lost my first love? Am I the type that has done this? Am I the type that has done that? So that you are prepared. So that you can have confidence. Because the greatest question people ask and worry about is, how do I know that I'm going to make heaven? How do I know? This teaching today and the one the series are on Thursday will simplify. If you just mark it, it will give you rest. It will help you deal with the assurance of salvation. Because some are worried. What if rapture costs me? Somebody told me, I'm a, whenever I hear rapture, I'm afraid. There's no need to be afraid. You just check your spiritual fitness. That's how. No need to be afraid. There are people that are looking up, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus. The Bible says that those, Hebrews 9.38, he said that Jesus is not coming for everybody. He's coming for those who are looking forward to his appearing. How can you look forward to his appearing when you are not spiritually fit? But if you have marked yourself on this and you see that you're spiritually fit, well done. But let me tell you what Jesus said. He said every day, keep taking one step closer. Keep taking one step closer. Don't yield to seducing spirit. What are seducing spirit? These are doctrines that take you away from God. When you listen to somebody preach, don't subject your life to just anybody. Not everybody is qualified to pastor your soul. Many are qualified to pass your pocket. Many are qualified to pass your career. But not everyone is qualified to pass your soul. Let me tell you how to know who is the pastor of your soul. When you listen to that person, that person draws you closer to God. You want to serve God more. You want to live holy. You want to live pure. You notice that your relationship with God is getting better. That is the pastor of your soul. You need a shepherd over your soul. Apart from Jesus, there's a physical shepherd. We are worried about, we, we, you can't just go and eat anywhere. Why? You're worried about your health. What disturbs me is how people can feed spiritually from anywhere. Meanwhile, if you die physically, it's fine. Don't feed from anywhere. Feed from rich pasture that will till the ground of your heart, till the ground of your soul. If you sit under someone and you realize, I'm not getting better. I also observe something. Some people are able to reach Mr. X and draw them closer to God. Others are not able to reach that same person. Find someone that is able to reach you. For instance, I can't reach everybody. No matter how powerful my message is, I can't reach everybody. But find who can reach you. Who will turn your heart to God. Stay under that and every day you'll be getting better. Let's just pray. Let's talk to God. Ask the Holy Spirit to shine touch light on your heart. Ask him to shine a touch light. I don't want to not to be spiritually fit. I don't want to be unfit, Lord. I don't want to be on feet. As the Holy Spirit, perhaps there are areas in my life. Perhaps there are dimensions. Perhaps there are things in me that are not pleasing you and I cannot see. Tell the Lord to shine a touch light on it. Ask God to liven your conscience again. Ask God, give me a tender conscience. That song says, whatever doesn't look like you, take it away, oh God. Take it away. As the Holy Spirit, show me those things that displease you in my life. Some of them, you already know what they are. This is the time to bring it before God and say, Lord, remove this out of me. Whatever it is that doesn't look like you, oh God, 
take it away from me. Burn it away, Lord. Let it not remain. Remember what Jesus told that church in Titania. He said, every day I'm seeing you take one step closer. I'm seeing you take one step closer. Meaning the way you were on Monday is not how you should be on Friday. That's how to be secure. The way you were on Friday is not how you're going to be next week. The way you were in January is not how you're going to be in February. Is there constant growth in your spiritual life? Marked growth that you can point to. Not in the spirit, not guesswork. You are not guessing about your improvement. You can actually see. Yes, last month I was a liar, but now it has changed. Last month my conscience could tolerate lies. My conscience could tolerate pride. My conscience could tolerate disobedience. But this month my conscience can no more tolerate it. That means there's improvement taking place. That means you are growing. That means you're increasing your fit in, in your spiritual fitness. Cry out to Lord and say, Oh God, whatever it is that doesn't look like you, take it away, oh God. Take it away, oh God. There's a consuming fire that burns. When you go to God and cry out to God, there's a consuming fire that burns. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2 says the Lord will sit on us as a refiner and as a purifier of silver. He says he's going to sit on the sons of Levi. They are sons of Levi, but guess what? They need purging. They are sons of Levi, but guess what? They need purifying. Perhaps you're a son of Levi. Perhaps you are in the house of God, but you need purging. Perhaps you're in the house of God, but you are not saved. You know that you're not spiritually fit. I'm going to lead you in prayer today. You know you have answered the altar call. You might even be a worker in the church. You might even be a pastor, but you're under the sound of my voice. And you know you are not spiritually fit. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance and confession. A number is going to be posted online right now that you can call immediately. But I'm going to verbalize a number. Call to get counseling. Tell the person that picks the call. I don't show, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not spiritually fit. I'm not spiritually fit. This is the time to cry out. Whether you are an unbeliever or you are a believer, this is the time. The purging fire of God is come to purge away. Remember the Bible says in Hebrews 9.14, it says that the blood is going to purge away. Your conscience is going to purge you. Your conscience, tell God, walk on my conscience. Give me a soft conscience. I cannot tolerate malice. I cannot tolerate offense. There are some Christians, they can keep offense in their heart for one year, two years, two weeks. You are in danger because you are not spiritually fit. Tell the Lord Jesus, let your blood cleanse your conscience from dead works. What are dead works? Things that you have not repented of. This is the time to say, Lord, I've gone through and I see where my problem is. It is a conscience problem. It is a conscience problem. My conscience is not soft. My conscience is not tender. You can tell people stupid and you are seeing normal. You can tell people idiot and you are seeing normal. There is a problem. You are not spiritually fit. Cry out and say, God, give me that conscience that is soft, that cannot tolerate sin, that cannot endure evil. Cry out. If you are not saved, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. If you are not born again, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. And then after that, I'm going to give you a number to call. Hallelujah. Just begin to tell the Lord, Father, help me. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your mercy. Tell the Lord, forgive you for your sins and for your righteousness. Remember, the Bible says, once the door is shut, you can no longer repent. Once the door is shut, there is no more forgiveness. Forgiveness is only a prerogative of the living. The moment the door is shut, there is nothing again you can do. Today you have mercy. Today you have forgiveness. Today you have cleansing. Today I can guarantee for tomorrow. I can guarantee for tomorrow. Father, just say after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you. And I ask for forgiveness. I ask for mercy. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse my heart from unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, purify me. Write my name in the book of life. Help me to walk this journey. Help me to make this journey in the name of Jesus. If you are praying, I pray after me. I'm going to pray for you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask, Lord, that the miracle of regeneration begins in the lives of these ones, oh God. I ask for a fresh cleansing, oh God. I ask that you hold your hands until the last day in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring them to shepherds and lead them in the right way, oh God. Thank you, Father. Now, if you pray that prayer and you're online, I'm going to give you two numbers so they can help you. The first number is 80 655 
The second number, Mr. Reese number, put it there. Any of these two, they're going to help you. They're going to guide you through the process. The number is, being, is on your screen right now. So that you can know what it takes to make the journey. If you want a shepherd to lead you on the journey of life. If you want to make it in eternity, what you need to do is what we have taught today. Check your spiritual thermometer. How hot am I? How hot am I? If you have made that prayer sincerely from the depths of your soul, I'm going to call out the numbers again. The first number is 080-655-60481. The second number is 080-6360-6765. If you're calling internationally outside Nigeria, I'm going to give you the number plus 234-80-655-60481. Or... Plus two three four eight zero six three six zero six seven six five. You might be listening via radio, Instagram, Facebook, whatever channel. Call these numbers right now. Somebody is waiting to take your call and to help you on the journey of life. Just go ahead and bless the name of the Lord for today. Thank Him. For some of us, He has brought calmness. For some, He has brought assurance. That don't worry on that journey. Stay on the journey. For some of us, He has pointed you in the right direction, telling you you still need to make amendments here and there. As a Holy Spirit, where are those areas I need to make amendments? Don't let me fall. Don't let me fall. Keep me burning, oh God. Keep me burning up until the end of day. Father, we give you praise. Keep Whatever doesn't look like me, thank you, Lord. My heart. Just tell Him. Give me fire in my heart.